Perfect. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for Lupus and You Answers Advocacy in Action. I'm so glad you are joining us this morning, and we have a great program today and looking forward to all of our presentations. First, I would like to thank our presenting sponsor, GSK. They are such a wonderful partner and supporter in many aspects of what we do here at the LFA, and we are just so grateful to them. Um, we are also so thrilled to have our Nita Roberts Christie here um, and part of today's program. Um, she has a great presentation for you all later. Next, I would like to thank our supporting sponsors. We work for Health Maryland and we work for Health Virginia. Um, it is so amazing to have a local support within the region and to make um, an impact in the local community. So thank you to these awesome um, supporting sponsors. Um, before we can begin, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, if at any time you have any general questions that you would like to submit to our speakers, you can add it to the chat. Um, we will have time at the end where our speakers will answer any questions. Um, don't forget to keep your mics muted. Um, keeping yourself muted will keep the flow of the program from being interrupted and save more time for any questions at the end of the presentation. Finally, this program will be recorded and you um, will receive a link of the recording along with helpful resources and a post-event survey where you can submit okay. feedback about today's program in an email. Um, so please just um, keep that in mind that we'll be able to send you this recording um, to watch again after the event. All right, so now to our agenda, this is a brief overview of our program. Um, I'll be sharing um, some information about the Lupus Foundation of America and some helpful resources and ways you can get involved. Then our amazing speakers will present on their topics. And then again, as I said, we'll have the opportunity to interact and ask some questions um, about their presentations. So let me get started on more about the Lupus Foundation of America. Um, you, the people affected by lupus, represent the heart and soul of our foundation. You are the central focus um, of everything that we do and are a constant reminder of our mission's urgency and serve to motivate us to continue to fight. Um, to put this simply, our goal at the Lupus Foundation of America is to one day end the impact of lupus and its suffering while ensuring that we provide the comprehensive support and programs people with lupus need today. Our programs stand upon three pillars, research, care and support services and advocacy. We have redefined lupus research to expand our efforts beyond just funding research grants. We are engaging all stakeholders to identify barriers that stand in the way of progress and setting a course to overcome them. And we do this by providing caring support for people affected by this devastating disease and leading advocacy efforts to bring more funding to research and services. Our research is patient-centered and focused on transforming lives. We have three goals, identifying the causes of lupus, discovering better ways to control symptoms, and ultimately finding pathways to cure lupus. People with lupus also are so important to the research process, and that's why we developed a new online research platform called RAY. RAY stands for Research Accelerated by You. And no one understands lupus better than those living with it. And you can help advance lupus right from the comfort of your own home by participating in RAY. You can share your experiences with lupus and help inform future clinical trials in new lupus treatments and identifying the most pressing needs of people with lupus. We also have our National Resource Center on Lupus, which is your one-stop resource center for all things. Um, so you can head to lupus.org slash resource to find um, this information in this awesome hub of information. We also have certified health education specialists who are trained to provide people with lupus, their families and caregivers um, with counseling and disease education and just resources. Um, our health educators can help you find trustworthy information to answer your questions and how to cope with it. Um, you can Contact a health educator and fill out our online form at lupus.org slash health educator. These individuals are so wonderful and can really help provide the support and answers you need. Next, we have a program called Take Charge, which is a 12-week education email series for people with lupus, including those recently diagnosed. When you sign up, you'll get an email from our health education specialist with tips and resources that can empower you to take charge of your health, 
The series covers important topics such as identifying and tracking your symptoms, sticking with your treatment plan, and getting the most out of your doctor's appointments. Um, you can find more information at lupus.org slash take charge. Finally, we have the expert series, which is our monthly educational podcast where the team interviews experts in the field about topics that are important to you. I personally love podcasts. I think it's a really wonderful form of media and a really great way to learn. So I definitely recommend checking this out um, if that is something that interests you. We also have a more than 150 support groups across the country where people with lupus can come together and ask questions and listen to one another. Um, many of these um, support groups are being held virtually due to the, pan due to the pandemic, um, but we're just really grateful to still be able to reach the community and kind of bring people together still. Also bringing people together is Lupus Connect, which is our online support community where members can engage with each other and ask each other questions. Moving on to ways to get involved with their organization and support the fight to end lupus. One way is through our Walk to End Lupus Now program. We are so excited to be back in person this year. Um, so head to walktoendlupus.org to find a walk near you. Our walks will be in the fall this year. So please let me know if you have any questions. We also will have a virtual option for those who are interested. We also have a program called Make Your Mark. It is a community fundraising program and a way to turn an event into a fundraiser for lupus. And finally, um, using your voice is the most powerful tool we have and we are the leader in stimulating federal support for lupus. Every day we fight to ensure the government is responsive to the needs of the 1.5 million Americans living with lupus. So definitely look into using your voice and signing up to be a lupus advocate today. As you know, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, I manage the DMV region. Um, so please reach out to me if you need anything at all. Um, I know there are many individuals from all over. So please, if you're interested, reach out. I can help you find um, your regional office and help you find um, local programmings and support and events near you as well. Um, I can share my email in the chat um, after my presentation. Finally, here is more information on how you can reach out to us at the LFA. You can follow us on social media, which is a great way to stay updated on all of the programs, events, and services that I've mentioned. Um, I'll also share the slide deck um, afterwards and some resources, as well as this event um, will be recorded. So you can always refer back if you need any of these links or contact information. So thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to, listen to me about the foundation. Um, I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, I'm so excited to have Dr. Ben Coley um, here with us today. Um, Dr. Ben Coley is the program director and division chief of rheumatology at the Carilion Clinic. Um, he sees and treats a large volume of patients and really has a special interest in SLE. And we're so grateful to have um, you here today, Dr. Ben Coley. Um, we're going to be working with you and the Carilion Clinic. And I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you to get ready for the presentation. Thank you. Um, I wanted everyone to see my avatar. Um, I use the AN avatar for everything I do, um, be it teams, you know, when I'm speaking at the ACR. Um, and so all of you can see what I look like. My background also has antibodies and plasma cells and B cells. Um, I actually stole this from the ACR, so I, I don't want to pretend I created it. Um, but that's because I truly do think, at least from our viewpoint, lupus is just very important. Um, and given that, you know, we, you know, a lot of people do a lot of speaking, at least about lupus, you may wonder why um, I sort of thought of going back to lupus 101. Um, but really, we all live complicated lives and, you know, as things have gotten more complicated, I, I think it's easy to forget the simple first steps. Um, and well, you know, 2020, you know, 2021, 2022, They've not been easy years, um, and I do think we need a reset. You know, we just all need to take a deep breath and start again. And with that being said, I will do that as well. And I'll say good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, nice to see all of you. Nice to see your avatars. Um, I love the cats. I love the pictures. Um, 
And for those of us who are a little too shy or don't have our pictures up, not to worry, we just love your presence. I wanted to thank um, us patients that are locked down. Um, it can be very difficult, you know, waking up, getting ready. Um, the family members um, who are supporting us, um, as well as people who are just curious and wanting to learn more. And I thought, seeing as um, we only had a limited amount of time, um, I would start off with what our goals were going to be so that hopefully um, we can cover all the things that we plan. So I thought we all have a good understanding of lupus. I mean, you know, that, that's why we're here. But sometimes as things go on, we sort of forget that it is more than just an ANA. Um, and, and the people caring for us can sometimes forget that the impact of lupus on us is more than just the antibodies. And sometimes, I, you know, I, I sort of feel even people who don't have expertise in lupus, you know, our primary care providers, they may feel, well, it, it's beyond me. But there are some really simple things um, that can be done in the primary care provider's office that even in the emergency room that are extremely helpful. And then sort of reviewing the concept of, yes, I have lupus, plus other things, rather than what many of us may be made to feel where it's lupus or it's nothing um and, and hopefully we're able to cover all these things and you know and, and, and at least add to the understanding um for each of us in some way that being said i mean i guess the first question is what is lupus and we all know it's more than just a blood test it, it is more than just the ana the ana is the reason i get up in the morning um if people are NA negative, then probably they don't need to see me um, in rheumatology. But you truly must have inflammatory symptoms um, for there to be active systemic lupus. Now, that doesn't mean that you didn't have lupus 20 years ago um, and the lupus isn't active right now, or you, know, you didn't have lupus last year and all of a sudden, or what are we saying? Um, if we sort of keep in mind simple or more common illnesses like diabetes. If your A1C is normal, then probably it's not the diabetes. Same thing in lupus, if it's not inflammatory, probably it's not the lupus and it's something else. Hence the term lupus plus instead of lupus or. We all know that lupus isn't cured, but it truly can be inactive for a number of years. And the inactivity can be inactive because of treatment that we're receiving. Or it could just be that as we age and mature and our body changes, that it is just inactive without medications. And you may see people referring to that as medication-free remission. And that could last for a number of years and we call that durable, or it could be only for a short period of time. And, and after which we need medications to be changed, altered, added, or new medicines to be introduced. So if something new were to happen, um, at least from our viewpoint as a patient, then we should be thinking this may be lupus, but it may also be a new problem. But many a times, um, if it's not the lupus, I think we sometimes feel as if, oh, so are we being told that there's nothing going on? But if we take the next step and say, well, okay, it's not the lupus, but have I developed diabetes or high blood pressure or eczema or asthma, um, that may go some distance in explaining the new things that have occurred or that's occurring to us right now. So as I alluded to earlier, I, I actually wish my license plate said ANA positive, for example. I mean, that, that would be perfect for me. Um, but then it, it, it brings to, to mind what the role of the ANA is, um, especially because some of us may have been told, oh, yes, the ANA is positive, but we don't have lupus. And I think that'd be, that can be quite confusing. You know, sort of being told your pregnancy test is positive, but you're not pregnant, or, you know, your prostate cancer test is positive, but you don't have prostate cancer. It, it can be quite confusing. Um, so the way I think of the ANA is the ANA test, if it's positive, allows me to consider lupus, especially if the titer is more than one is to 80. Again, 
very, very annoying um, because the best way I have to explain to patients is we all have a positive ANA. What we've decided is a particular number is abnormal, but everybody who is tested probably has an ANA, very low titers, and probably not of any clinical significance. But when it gets to a certain number, then it becomes an issue. Again, I sort of compare things to other diseases that people may understand. Diabetes, we all have sugar in our blood, all of us. We then worry when the sugar is over a certain number. All of us have blood pressure, but if the blood pressure is more than 140, we say, oh, now it's too high. That way around, we understand that the ANA doesn't diagnose lupus, but allows us to consider lupus. In fact, I'll go as far as to say the only positive thing, the only helpful thing about an ANA is if it's negative, then it tells me that this is not an ANA related disease. Now there are many diseases that are ANA related, but in, in my world, we're particularly interested in lupus, but you know, it rules out some types of thyroid disease and things like that. But if it's negative, it's very helpful to me, um, at least from the viewpoint of lupus. Of course, there are other diseases that have things that look like lupus, so rheumatoid arthritis. You know, well, it could be that, especially if the ANA is negative. So sort of just thinking about the ANA, the American College of Rheumatology, I thought, have a very helpful patient information sheet. And I use this a lot with people who just have a positive ANA and no other um, issues or clinical symptoms. I sort of remind people that about one in 10 people would have a positive ANA. And this increases with age. In fact, by the time you get to 65, it's about 30 to 35% of people who have a positive ANA. Sometimes medication related, sometimes viruses. And of course, we can imagine COVID being so common right now. A lot of people have positive ANAs and positive antiphospholipid antibodies as a result of COVID infections. These tend to be transient and sort of uh, pitter out over time, um, they do become negative as time goes on. Um, but it certainly is worth keeping those things in mind. And the, again, you know, the, a &A, the American College of Rheumatology look at it the way I look at it, I think, because in, in the patient information sheet, they say, what does a positive ANA reading mean? And they answer it in the negative. They say a negative reading means there's no autoantibodies present in your body. However, a positive ANA reading alone does not indicate an autoimmune disease. Again, for me, the autoimmune disease would be lupus, but you know, they literally are meaning any ANA-related disease. And they go as far as to say that a positive ANA reading simply tells your doctor to keep looking. Now I flip this and I say a positive ANA means see a rheumatologist, and a negative ANA tells your doctor to keep looking for something else that's not ANA-related. So then what is lupus? And I tell people it's more than a diagnostic criteria. Because I have people coming in and say, hey, you know, I meet this and I meet that. And I tell them all, it's much more than a diagnostic criteria. If you look at the most recent European um, League Against Rheumatic Disease and the ACR criteria, they actually say that to enter the, um, that to enter the ANA criterion, that you really need a positive ANA of equal to or greater than one is to 80. And that's the only role of the ANA. After that, the ANA has no value. It just allows you to enter into the criteria or to, it allows us to consider if your symptoms are related to lupus or not. And I tell people, the simplest thing is if your primary care doctor or the ED has done a CBC, which they always do. Everybody does a CBC as part of your you know, routine, sort of blood tests. And if you're anemic, then I say, hey, then we should consider, is this hemolytic anemia? Okay, then we can consider it part as lupus. If your platelet count is less than 100,000, if your white count is less than 4,000, especially if the lymphocyte count is less than 1,000, then we should be considering that. Now, interestingly enough, those three things should be found on a CBC. So already on the simple test that your, your, um, uh, your primary care provider would be doing, it can give us an indication if the ANA should be thought of as meaningful or not. The only other sort of um, 
test that your primary care may do that could be helpful is the kidney test. Although if you look, the sort of kidney test that we're looking for that will form part of the criteria is not the one that your doctor would do. But if you have a kidney test and the kidney test is relatively normal, then I say that we may be able to rule out lupus related kidney disease or lupus nephritis, even though it's not a biopsy and it's not a urine test, you know, which is what we really would be looking for. If your BUN creatinine is relatively normal, then probably your kidneys are fine. So in theory, two of the major components of lupus can be ruled out just based on the simple test without us needing to think about, you know, the more complicated antibody tests that people generally think about. And I sort of think that if we do those things, if those things are being considered, it's very helpful to us as patients um, and allows us to start to consider what else, if anything else could be contributing. So the symptoms, and I tell people, this is what makes lupus. Um, if I don't have symptoms of lupus, then I don't have lupus. And here I use strange examples. Um, so if I'm speaking to a, you know, to a, um, a woman, I'd sort of say, you know, if you have your PSA is elevated, but you know, you don't have, um, uh, and your biopsy is negative for prostate cancer, then it's probably not prostate cancer. If I'm talking to a male patient, I say, hey, if your beta HCG is positive, you know, and you know, obviously you're not pregnant then we need to think about other things. The symptoms are truly what makes this disease. And I sort of say, there's been a change in the way we approach the symptoms of lupus, um, because people in general now understand that it's lupus plus, not lupus or. So we split the symptoms into the typical type one inflammatory symptoms, um, and then the type two non-inflammatory symptoms. And this, I would say, relatively recent um, addition to the armory of lupus in the way we sort of think about things and allows us to change our approach and understand that even the things that we may not consider lupus symptoms still need to be approached or treated um, properly rather than being ignored. So that means, well, what are these inflammatory symptoms that you know, we're all looking for? And um, this is from um, my colleagues in Duke. Um, I think they published this in 2019, if I remember correctly. And they classified them as auto-inflammatory, autoimmune, or organ damaging symptoms. And these symptoms respond to immunosuppression. So when, when we give you medicines to reduce the activity of the immune system, these symptoms get better. And the, the more um, problematic ones would be the kidney disease or the nephritis, um, the inflammatory arthritis, which is again, different from joint pain, um, the rashes, the fluid in your lungs and around your liver, the ulcers, hair loss, inflammation of blood vessels and the muscles, the CDC findings that we spoke about earlier, um, the CNS findings, um, inflammation in your um, stomach and in your lungs, and then the type two symptoms such as the fatigue, the widespread pain, um, sort of brain fogging, sleep problems, depression, anxiety, memory issues. Those are type two symptoms that do not respond to, uh, to immunosuppressive treatment but still must be addressed. Um, sometimes can be addressed by your primary care, sometimes by the rheumatologist, sometimes by a neurologist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but certainly must be addressed. Part of the problem from our viewpoint as patients is, hey, but doc, what are we doing for this particular thing? Or are my medicines not working because I don't seem to be getting better? Well, if we remember the medicines are really only useful for the auto-inflammatory, autoimmune, inflammation and organ related things, and not particularly helpful for the type two symptoms, which really means that those of us on Celsept or Plaquenil, 
may think the medicines aren't working when indeed they are, um, they're keeping the symptoms controlled, but just that we have other symptoms that those medicines can't really help with. Um, hence, we need something and the inflammatory medications. We need something to take care of the type two symptoms while we're using our type one medications as well. And again, I sort of go back to, hey doc, you mean I have lupus and I have something else? And my answer is nearly always, yes, we do need to address the something else as well. So then what do we do? I think if we remember that all of the medicines that are generally prescribed by the rheumatologist would only help with our type one symptoms, then we do need to address the type two symptoms depending on what the cause of those things are. So I'm fatigued all the time, then maybe I need to check if I'm sleeping properly at night, if I need something to help me sleep. Do I have sleep apnea that can be addressed? Is something keeping me awake? Am I having pain that's actually interrupting my sleep that then needs to be addressed as well? And is that pain inflammatory in nature? So should I be adding an anti-inflammatory medicine? Or is that pain a type two symptom and does it need to be addressed with another type of medication? There really is no overlap between the um, type two and the type one symptoms. Um, but the type one symptoms can lead to type two symptoms if the type one symptoms aren't being addressed fully. So of course, if my kidneys are a problem, and I'm needing to do peritoneal dialysis and things like that, and that's keeping me up, I can be fatigued. So sometimes we actually don't need anything specific for the type two symptoms. Sometimes it's a case of making changes to our lifestyle, making changes to things that may impact on those things. But other times we do need something categorically to be done about the type two symptoms. Sometimes it's a type one medicines that can have an impact on our type two symptoms. And the more common one I think about is, I'm on steroids, it affects my sleep, I can't sleep properly at night, it's making my anxiety and my mood worse. Well, the answer there is not to add additional medicines, the answer is to get my steroids to as low as possible so that I can sleep better. The problem may be that I need the steroids for my type one symptoms, and I may need to add other medications to the steroids to allow myself to come down off the steroids and improve my type two symptoms. So it, it is a little bit of a sort of like a hamster wheel, um, especially if we're not thinking about lupus in its full gamut of symptoms and we're sort of thinking about it in, with a limited approach, it then makes it a bit more difficult to address all of the symptoms. So then, how should we think about lupus? Every time I see someone and every time I sort of think about people in general and think about myself in general, I sort of think about type one symptoms and type two symptoms. And I apply this to everything else. If somebody has a heart attack, the chest pain will be type one symptom. But if I'm feeling depressed after my heart attack, that will be a type two symptom. If I, I'm struggling with cancer, the type one symptom will be, hey, I'm having trouble breathing if it's lung cancer. The type two symptom may be, now I'm getting my chemo, I'm fatigued all the time, and I'm losing my hair, but maybe there's nothing I can do about that right now. And if I think about things in those lines, and I know I need to address both of those things, and it may be as simple as buying me a wig in lupus, it may be as simple as, hey, I'm there for you, I'm here to support you, my family is here to support me, but sometimes it may be that I need to do something else as well. More importantly, I think we in the lupus community need to get away from thinking of, oh, it's either lupus or it's nothing at all, and I can't help you there, but we should be thinking more of it's lupus plus you have something else that I should be helping you with as well. So when we think about that, I say it does seem a little too simple, Bangoli. You've put it in a way that 
I'm not sure. And I tell people, yes, and that's because this is lupus 101, so we can reset, especially given you know, what we went through in 2000, uh, in 2020, and sort of just go back and revisit what we can accomplish. And then we can build on those things so we can then address each individual exactly at their point of need. So from our viewpoint, what have we done today? Well, we've gone back to the basics. We've said, what is lupus? We've said, what are the symptoms and what are the types of symptoms? We said, how is lupus diagnosed? Then and how are those symptoms managed? Because without doing that, then we can't have an open discussion between ourselves, between us as patients, us as family members who are supporting patients, and between patients and doctors trying to help achieve what can be achieved. And where do we learn this from? We learn this from the patients who actually listed the symptoms that were important to them. And again, I've mentioned here, fatigue being a real source of problems to our patients that we weren't necessarily addressing simply because we felt, well, it's not necessarily part of the type one symptoms of lupus and doesn't always improve when we give immunosuppressive medicines. But the good thing with the patient registries is we've been able to see what's important, not just to us as, you know, in the lupus community, but to us more globally, both patients and doctors to say, hey, you know, this is number one for my patient and I've not been able to address this. And with that, I'll hand back over. Um, and if we have any questions, we're all here to help. Thank you so much, Dr. Bencoli. That was really helpful of a mind reset for myself and hopefully for everyone as well. And please think over any thoughts or questions you may have and throw them into the chat and we will get them after our next presentation. Um, I am so excited to introduce Arnita Roberts Christie, who is a patient engagement liaison from GSK. Um, she's going to be sharing a presentation on living with lupus and managing lupus lifestyle and just big thank you to Arnita for your support and GSK support in creating today's program. Um, the screen is all yours if you want to get started and share your presentation. Okay, yes I do. Good morning everyone and um, I'm going to share screen. Okay. So good morning again, everyone, and thank you to Leanna from the Lupus Foundation of America. And uh, thank you to Dr. Bacoli for helping us reset where we are in this lupus journey. And so, you know, going back to the basics, I, you know, reiterate what Dr. said is that you know, the last two plus years has been an opportunity for us to reset not just our medical conditions, but also our lives in general. There are so many things that we have had to look at in a different way, so many opportunities that we've had to flex. And so I agree, this is a wonderful time to reset, to remind us of what information we knew about lupus, to give us some additional information that we may have forgotten about it. So as Leanna said, my name is Arnita Roberts Christie. I am one of the patient engagement liaisons here at GSK. I am a registered nurse and have been for over 35 years. I've been in this lupus space for the last 10 years. And my goal today is not to diagnose not to say what treatment plan is better than the other, but it is really to empower you to ask questions that of your healthcare provider that you did not ask before or didn't feel confident enough to ask before, to encourage you to live your best lupus life, as I would say, as you're on this lupus journey. And to, again, remind you of some information that you may have gotten way back when, if you've been living with lupus for 20 plus years or 20 plus days, I believe that it's always a good opportunity to review information. And so that's what we're gonna do here for, uh, I'm gonna set my clock for the next few minutes. And so we'll get started.
And so lupus, edu you know, what we'll cover today, lupus education, I'm going to reiterate or review a lot of the information that Dr. Bancoli had given. We'll talk about treatment goals, symptom tracking, communication. Communication is so critical as a lupus warrior between you and your healthcare pro provider. That, that communication, that I call it like a marriage, has to be top of mind and really, really strong. And then sticking to a treatment plan. What does it mean to be adherent? Or what does it mean to be non-adherent? Your role, and I often will refer to you living with lupus as a lupus warrior. Hold on one second. There we go. Your role is so critically important to this, this mix. It's you know your body best. And so you can wake up in the morning and say, there's something just not quite right. You might not be able to put your finger on it, but you know that. And so being knowing your body and being engaged and informed in your healthcare is one of the biggest roles that you play in your life. And it can help you by discussing what you're feeling with your healthcare provider. And it helps you to actively manage your healthcare because you know your body best and your healthcare provider understands the disease of lupus, the treatments might be best for you. That's where that togetherness comes in. And that can lead to better health outcomes and to a better relationship between you. And so when I talk about being an informed patient, I'm also talking about being an engaged patient. And here at GSK, we believe that there are at least four attributes to being an engaged patient. One of them you're doing right now just by being here. You are educating yourself. Another will be by monitoring and tracking your symptoms. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. Another is communicating with your healthcare provider. That communication is a two-way street. It's you communicating with them and them communicating with you. That is the best way to be engaged in your healthcare. And then taking ownership of your health. That means you are being proactive. You are getting ahead of what might be happening to your body. So proactive, meaning getting ahead of, as opposed to being reactive, which is meaning just letting things happen and you have no idea why or what's next. And we believe that being an engaged patient is one who really takes ownership of their health journey. So if we talk about education, Dr. Ben Coley did a phenomenal job of talking about ANA, of talking about symptoms of, of type one and type two for lupus. And I'm just gonna go a little bit, you know, reiterating what he said and going a little bit further. So we know that lupus is an autoimmune disease. If you take that word autoimmune and divide it in half, auto means self what your body is, and then immune system. All of us have an immune system. And if you think about your immune system as like a raincoat, your rain, the raincoat helps protect your body from droplets of rain. Your immune system helps protect your body from bacteria or viruses that might attack it. When your body doesn't recognize your own cells, it starts to fight. And that's where that auto part comes in. It starts to fight your own immune system. And when it does that, it attacks cells that are your healthy cells. You know, I initially said that your immune system helps keeps out viruses and bacteria because your body doesn't recognize those as part of your cells. But when you have lupus, your body doesn't recognize that your cells are your own cells and it starts to fight them. And that's where we get that terminology of a lupus warrior. With that fight comes inflammation, comes pain, and can come damage to your organs. Another way of thinking of inflammation is, I always use this example because it's really real for me. You think of a paper cut paper cut, real small, 
get it on your finger. And when you look at it, it's like you sometimes can't even see it until it becomes inflamed, until it becomes reddened, until it becomes uh, painful to touch and until it swells up or becomes more inflamed. That's what happens with lupus. The, that inflammation, that pain or damage can occur on the inside of the body or on the outside of the body. We call lupus a chronic illness because it is an illness that has lasted more than three months in the body. And it goes through a cycle where it goes to sleep or it wakes up, it goes into remission, or it becomes like a flare. On average, we know that unfortunately, sometimes it may take anywhere from four to six years for diagnosis, and that is because lupus presents itself in so many different ways and so many different times of the year. We often say in the lupus community, one person with lupus is one person with lupus. And that is because of the way that it presents so differently in so many different ways to so many different people. Lupus can affect many body parts. Now, what you see here on the screen are a number of different areas of the body and often you know, a number of different uh, systems of the body. It does not mean that this list is conclusive or exhaustive, but what it does, what we do know is that many of you that are diagnosed with lupus complain about these areas in particular being affected by your lupus. We're going to talk about the brain a little bit more when lupus affects the small blood vessels of the brain, and sometimes that's called a lupus fog. When lupus affects the eyes, you can have you know, sores on the lower, on the inside lids of the eyes. You can have sores in your nose and in your mouth, in your, on your skin, the, the butterfly rash that can come here. You put your two fingers here. It can spread out as such. It can also occur on your areas of your shoulders, your trunk area. When lupus affects your heart or your lungs, you can sometimes have chest pain or shortness of breath. When lupus affects your kidneys, you can, I encourage everyone to look at your urine when you urinate. Look in the toilet. Is your urine dark? Is it light colored? Is it cloudy? Is it clear? Do you see red streaks in it? Do you see what I call tiny bubbles or lots of little bubbles in the toilet? Those symptoms can be an indication that lupus has now affected your kidneys. Um, does it affect your, your muscles, your joints, your bones? Do you wear a certain ring on your finger and now all of a sudden you can't get that ring on? Do you wear a certain pair of shoes, your favorite pair of shoes? And all of a sudden, it's more challenging to get your foot into your shoes. All of the symptoms that I've named and many that I have not are indications that lupus could possibly have affected these different areas. And this is an opportunity for you to communicate with your healthcare provider. So physical symptoms are visible on the outside of the body. So if you weigh yourself, doesn't have to be on a daily basis, could be on a weekly basis, you could notice that your weight has gone up one to two pounds. Or if you have a favorite pair of jeans that you wear and you notice that it's just a little bit more snug and it's not because of something that you've eaten at a cookout. Um, hair loss. When you comb your hair, there, it is normal for a couple of strands to come out every day, every time you comb your hair. But hair loss with lupus is you comb your hair and there is what I call a wad of hair, a big chunk of hair that has come out. And you may even notice ball spots around the edges, or you may have someone that will say to you, hey, Arnita, did you know that you had a ball spot like right there in the top of your head? Well, I may have not seen it because I'm always combing my hair back or I may have braids. We talked again about the joint swelling, the sores. These are symptoms that occur on the outside of the body. Not a conclusive list, meaning not all these symptoms are, are listed, 
But what happens when lupus occurs on the inside of the body? And that's where it is lupus attacks our organs on the inside. And unless you do what's called an invasive look, unless you take something and look on the inside of the body, you may not be aware of that. And that's why when it talks about lupus affecting the kidneys, it's so important for you to look at your urine, for you to be aware of what could be happening. Dr. Bencoli talked about fatigue and Fatigue is not just being tired, meaning I wake up and, okay, I'm tired today. No, fatigue is an abnormal amount of tiredness that occurs throughout the body without much effort. One of the examples I want to share is, let's say you wake up in the morning and you say, and you give this look like this woman on the screen, <sighs> okay, I'm tired, but then you you sit up in the bed and you put your feet on the side of the bed and you go, wow, I am really tired. I don't have the energy to make it to the bathroom. Okay, I can make it to the bathroom. I sit on the commode and I have to sit there for an extra five minutes because I'm, I'm so tired, I now can't get into the shower. Okay, now I've gotten in the shower and now I can't stand up to brush my teeth. I have to sit down. These are some examples of what it might be when you are fatigued. I also encourage my patients to develop a scale of what your fatigue is like. So let's say you develop a scale and your fatigue is like a nine or a 10. Examples of that are what I just shared a few minutes ago also could be I don't have the energy to make dinner tonight. Or I was scheduled to go out with my friends. I was really looking forward to it. I don't have the energy to do that. Or I have to go to school today, but I really don't have the energy to do that. That could be on that scale of fatigue, a nine or a 10. Let your support system, and I call you your support system, the village, let them know what that fatigue is like. Let them know that your fatigue today is a nine or a 10, and this is what you can or cannot expect from me today. But if your fatigue is like a two or three, you can get up, you shower, hey, you could even walk to the corner store, and your fatigue is a two, and this is what you can expect from me today. I can go to work. I may be able to be may be able to work a little bit later if you ask if you ask me. But know that you are not alone with your fatigue. Research has shown that 80 to 90 percent of those of you living with lupus experience some level of fatigue. And I encourage you let your village know where you are on the fatigue scale on a given on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, so that they can know what to expect to, from you, what not to expect from you, and how they can best support you. At GSK, we have a program or a support system called Us in Lupus. At the end of this presentation, I am going to put up some QR codes where you can take your smartphone if you have one. And yes, this is an opportunity if you have, if you're watching this presentation on your smartphone and if there's someone else by that has one, that you will be able to take your smartphone right up to the screen and put it around a QR code and you will be able to, you know, it will put up a search engine where it's either Safari or, uh, Chrome or Edge, and it will take you right to our usinlupus.com website. But many patients that visit this Us in Lupus website, Facebook, Twitter, this particular patient wrote, the fatigue, pain down to the bone, swelling and sweating every time I try to, to grocery shop for myself is tough. Sometimes I have to leave the groceries on the counter and quickly lay down before my legs give out. This is what this lupus visitor wrote. Perhaps you have experienced this. 
on this website of usinlupus.com, patients will write statements like this. And other times there will be patients who will respond to this statement with words of encouragement. So I encourage you to visit us on this website. Earlier, I talked about brain fog. I talked about when lupus affects the very small blood vessels of the brain. Know that you are not alone if you become easily confused, if you experience memory issues, or if there's an inability to concentrate. More than half of you living with lupus may experience this brain fog. Another example, let's say you go to the physician's office and they say, hey, Arnita, you know, you're doing well. I do want to see you back in three months just to make sure to check your blood work. Um, please, you know, come back and visit me in three months. And the physician walks out of the door. In comes nurse. And she says, hi, Arnita. You know, I heard your appointment went well. When does the doctor want to see you back? And you give this blank stare. And you may look down or you may look up or you may be looking for the answer, but you don't remember. That is very real. It's nothing to be ashamed about or, or embarrassed about. That's how lupus has affected your brain. And so what can you do? Number one, you could take someone with you every time you visit the physician's office, or you could take a pencil and paper with you and write down what your physician says, or you can use that same smartphone and write in the notes section, this is when the physician wants to see me again. But know that you are not alone. Again, more than half of you that are living with this, this disease experience brain fog or a lupus fog, it can also be called. I'm so glad that our presentations are diverse because although lupus primarily affects women of childbearing age, one in 10 men are diagnosed with the disease of lupus. Now their symptoms may be a little bit different and they may not be aware that what they are experiencing are lupus or symptoms that are related to lupus. So just if there are men out there, know that you are not alone as well. And so let's talk about some common classes of medications and what their goals might be. Managing lupus through your treatment, there are goals that you and your doctor together want to achieve. One of them, some common ones may be experiencing fewer signs and symptoms of your lupus. You want to get ahead of your flares because one of the flares may be you are, when you go out into the sun between the hours of 10 and four, the ultraviolet rays may be just too much for your body and it could send you into a flare. And you want to get ahead of that. What could you do? Could you put on a big flappy hat? Could you um, put on long sleeves? You may, your goal may be you want to prevent as many flares as possible. Or perhaps you want to minimize your long-term organ damage or reduce inflammation. You want to wear that certain ring or put on um, those certain pair of shoes on a more often than not, or perhaps you want to minimize certain side effects from medications. These are just a list of some common goals or for treatment, not a exhaustive list. There are a number of different goals that I could have added or we at GSK could have added, but this is just some ideas. And while some symptoms can come and go, lupus, as Dr. Ben Coley sh shared with us, does not go away. It can be managed through, though through treatment plans that you and your healthcare provider agree to together. And so some classes of medications, and Dr. Ben Coley really explained these, of how these medications really fit to the symptoms that you might be feeling. And so whether it's an anti-inflammatory or an immunosuppressant or a corticosteroid or an anti-malarial, and perhaps it's an immunomodulator or a diuretic, 
a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor. Whatever your, you and your healthcare provider decide is part of your treatment plan is very specific to you. You may have other lupus warriors who might say, you know, Arnita, my doctor has me on this plan and it's working really well. Well, that may not be the plan that your healthcare provider has for you. And that may not be the plan that's best for you. So this is where that communication comes in, that two-way communication between you and your healthcare provider, making sure that the treatment plan that is designed for you, that you, the two of you talk about what's best for you based on your lifestyle, your values, and your morals. Other treatments um, may involve massage therapy, counseling, talking to someone about your mental and your emotional state. And I do want to say there is nothing wrong with talking to someone about your mental and emotional state. We are going through a lot on a daily basis and having the added diagnosis of an autoimmune disease really can take that stress level from here to here. Talk to someone about it. Talk to them about how, you know, maybe meditation might be helpful, maybe mindfulness, being present, learning how to be present to where you are on the lupus journey without judgment of where you are. This lupus journey is not an easy one, and you will have peaks and valleys and learning how to manage that. Sometimes you may need to add in lifestyle changes, making sure that you are getting enough sleep. Enough sleep for one person may be different for another person, but doing you know, some trial and error to see what is the best amount of sleep that can help your body function at its optimal or best level. Staying active doesn't mean you need to run a marathon, but it does need mean that you need to move. You could do something, if you're flamed, you could do some simple movements like Tai Chi or yoga. If you're not inflamed, you can walk a little bit longer than usual, but making sure that you are walking and practicing good self-care. And as I talk about symptom tracking, another lupus warrior wrote, keeping a daily journal can help you and your doctor to discover what may be triggers for some of your symptoms. You, your triggers can change over time and keeping a journal can help you with that. I love this picture of this young woman because she is showing youthfulness and using her smartphone, she may keep her uh, symptoms in her the notes section or she may have downloaded an app where she can keep her symptoms. Someone like me, I may have a calendar where I put a smiley face for it's a good day or an upside down smiley face where it's been a challenging day. The most important part of this is that if you are not tracking your symptoms, that number one, you start. And that number two, you do your best to keep it going. You may not be a writer or a typer. You may want to verbalize your symptoms and, and log that as part of, you know, there are other apps that you can, you know, um, you can uh, record yourself. And then when you get to the doctor's office, press the, the play button so that your doctor can hear. Make sure you put the date and the time that you're recording it so that your doctor could know when in the month or from the last time he or she saw you to this time, where those symptoms were occurring. Another area is called health journaling, and that's keeping like a detailed record of your health experience. What's been your diagnosis journey? What's that been like? You may have been living with lupus symptoms and you just realize, well, wow, I've had these symptoms off and on for a number of years. I have tests now that I need to understand if this test is positive, what does this mean? Does this mean I need this pr procedure? Well, what was the outcome of this procedure? I started on this medication. Well, now I'm on this one. Having a health journal can help you keep on top of that the same way as tracking your symptoms. 
Health journaling can be an expressive way. Sometimes we just hold so much on the inside. When you are able to express it, when you are able to get it out, you can express it verbally or you can express it by writing. But writing can help you organize your thoughts as well. And that has been proven to reduce stress and help you manage the uncertainties of lupus. Over time, your health journal, your symptom tracking, when you share that with your healthcare provider can help you live your best lupus life as you are on this journal journey, excuse me. So again, finding a format that works for you, the most important part of it is that you start. Make it a part of your routine. You wake up in the morning, you put your feet on the side of the bed, you journal, you record or you write. And, but again, and then you can share this with your healthcare team. As I said, this communication is so necessary. It's necessary that there is a two-way street and that you involve others. Hey, Arnita, I'm at a 10 today for my, my fatigue. This is what you can expect from me and this is what you cannot expect from me. Have that two-way street with your village and have that two-way street of communication with your healthcare provider. Again, don't be embarrassed by what you're feeling. This is your journey. Be present to where you are without judgment. Before your next doctor's appointment, take some time to look at your symptoms. Think about how your symptoms are impacting your life on a daily basis, whether you're at school, at work, um, in your community. How is it impacting you? Think about the goals that you have. What do you want to achieve with your goals? You know, try to have a buddy go with you to your appointment and then practice what you say. And during your appointment, have a list of your medications available. Be an active listener, meaning you're listening what the doctor says, you're writing it down, don't be afraid to ask questions and then consider whether or not you need to go see another specialist. Just for a quick moment here, I wanna talk a little bit about telehealth, which allows you to connect with your doctor through your smartphone or your tablet or your computer. The same way that you would have uh, face-to-face visits, you need to do the same thing that with your telehealth visit. They may ask you how much you weigh, if you've been able to take your blood pressure or your temperature, updating your health journal, that face-to-face, -face, when you are face-to-face -face for appointment, all of that can transfer over to a telehealth visit. Make sure that your battery on your phone and or your, your tablet or your computer, make sure is, is at 100%. Make sure that you have a safe, excuse me, make sure that yes, you have a safe space to communicate and make sure that you have a quiet place to communicate. Follow up with your discussions, you can have general consultations during here. You can talk about your medication changes as well as your mental health checkups. As we begin to close this, I wanna talk a little bit about adherence. Adherence means staying on your treatment plan as you and your healthcare provider has discussed. Your treatment plan is specific to you. And as you work with your healthcare provider to find the right treatment plan that's specific to you, make sure that you understand all of your options. Staying adherent, staying on your treatment plan can help you improve your outcomes and reduce your costs in terms of healthcare. Not staying adherent or not staying on your treatment plan can cause worsening of conditions, worsening of symptoms, may have you going to your healthcare provider more often, or even visiting the urgent care center or the emergency room. So make sure you know what to expect from your uh, healthcare. 
and then coordinating all of your plan and treatments. Listed in front of you are a number of different specialists. Dermatologists looks at your skin, your nephrologists, often we call them our kidney doctors. Your therapist will focus on your emotional and mental state. Your cardiologist will look at your heart, rheumatologist, bones, um, your bones and your your joints and they may, may be the quarterback for all of your care or it may be your primary care physician again listed are a number of different specialists may not be an exhaustive list you may have other specialists or you may not have all of these specialists just a few that may be relative again to review non-adherent Skipping a dose or, make, or taking a smaller dose means that you're not being adherent to how the medication was prescribed for you. You know, if your doctor says, Arnita, I want you to take it at 8 a.m. and at 4 p.m., but I decide to take it at 10 a.m. and at 11 p.m., well, that's extending the time between doses. If you stop a medication without talking to your doctor, that's considered non-adherent. So tips for being more adherent, understand how the medication works, understanding what side effects you can expect from the, from the medication. Set reminders on your phone, on your, you know, your, your watch or in your, you know, like a little um, reminder that I had that I'm nearing the time that I, I allotted to speak. Um, set reminders, create a calendar, involve others, say, hey, I have a daughter. I said, can you just remind me that I need to do something at 10 o'clock? This is the support system and the village that can help you. And as I promised, this, these are QR codes that you can find that will take you to our usinlupus.com website. So if you take your smartphone and you take it right up to the QR code or to those boxes and you push on the camera part of your smartphone and you put it right up there, it will have yellow boxes and I'm doing it with you, a yellow box that will take you right to the usinlupus.com website. So I press on my yellow box, up comes us in lupus and it talks about confidence. Are you with us? And then you can scroll down and then it shows your part where you can put in your email address where Putting in your email address will allow you to receive additional information like a lupus tracking kit or symptoms about tracking your lupus or uh, learning how to keep your disease activity low or even finding out financial impact information. So if I've gone too fast, I do apologize, but um, you can certainly write down usinlupus.com, which will take you to that website. And I wanna thank you. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me as we learned a little um, reminders about managing your lupus, or perhaps you learned something new today. I do hope that you've taken at least one thing away from you from this presentation that will help you live your best lupus life as you are on this journey. So I am going to stop sharing screen and turn it back over to Lee. Thank you so much, Arnita. That was so wonderful. And I think a really great reminder from both of these speakers um, to kind of take it back to the basics and don't forget to monitor yourself and your symptoms and to work directly with your um, care team. Um, it's really important to do that so you can kind of get the best personalized care for yourself and kind of make yourself feel the best as possible. Um, I want to remind you all to throw some questions into the chat if you have any. And I know um, Philip did add a question for Arnia just to clarify, and I think I can as well. Um, but that 10% of lupus occurs in men, not 10% of men will get lupus. Um, that is um, accurate. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I apologize <laughs> for misstating that. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you again. And I did also want to um, touch on something else that all of these um, presentations reminded me of, of getting back to the basics of our routine in our lives right now. Something that is regular in all of our lives is 
COVID and the pandemic and monitoring that as well. So I did want to ask Dr. Bengkoli um, if you could touch on um, just kind of the, the fears of the population of going to the doctors in this um, pandemic space, um, if you could just kind of give any advice or kind of any feedback to the community who is at risk um, today. That's a, a really, really, really good question. Um, a, a very practical question that we, you know, that we come across um, both as patients, um, you know, with concerns about going somewhere where a large number of people who may be ill are congregating. Um, with patients with concerns about being on medications that prevent your or inhibit your ability to mount an adequate response to prevent you from getting ill. Um, truly a, a very, very good question, very timely. Um, it's important to remember that your doctor's office is probably the safest place you'll go to. Let, let's be quite frank about that. Um, if you go shopping, if you go into Walmart, you don't know who you're coming across. Right? None of those people are screened. Um, in your doctor's office, every single member of staff is fully immunized, screened routinely, and other patients that you come across are also screened before they can come in. Um, and have the same concerns as us. I mean, they're all concerned about the same thing. They don't want to get sick from you, and I don't want to get sick from them. It's exactly the same thing. Um, but there are some caveats um, that we do have to understand. There are some specific medicines that actually inhibit your, your response to mount an adequate um, vaccine response. And probably the most important of which, at least within the lupus community, um, would be a mycophenolate, um, which we use quite commonly in lupus, especially lupus nephritis and things of that nature. So if you're on Celsept, mycophenolate sodium, mycophenolate mofetil, your ability to, um, to mount a response to COVID is really quite low. Even when you get boosted, you know, the second, third booster, the fourth booster, you're still at a much lower rate than people not on mycophenolate. Um, so that you do need to consider. And then the second group of medicines, um, we use, but less commonly in lupus, would be rituximab. Um, rituximab actually get rid of the cells that make the antibodies. Um, so in those two groups of patients, I would say think very carefully. Um, I'm an advocate of telemedicine. There's nothing wrong with doing telemedicine. Um, we have special arrangements for people in our clinic. Um, you can come in at these certain times or on these certain days. Um, you can come in where there's fewer people coming over lunchtime. Um, and you and your doctor can sort of discuss those things to work out a plan that works best. But it's more important that you are seen than you are not seen. Okay? Even in patients with lupus, you're more likely to have a complication of lupus than have a complication of COVID. Okay? Um, if we keep in mind that there is a lot of people who have had complications of COVID, but that's because COVID is so prevalent. So you're looking at a complication rate of about 2 to 3%. But in a, you know, in a disease where 100 million people have gotten it, 2 to 3% is a lot of people. Whereas in lupus, you have a complication rate of you know, 15, 20%, which is so much higher, less than COVID, because you know, you're looking at, what, 500,000 people maybe? So much less than COVID, but it's because of the actual numbers. But those of us that you know, sort of have lupus or are living with lupus, it's more important that you are seen than you're not seen. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ben Coley. Um, I think it's a really good reminder to make sure you, you do go to the doctors and just really work with your team um, to make sure you're most comfortable. Um, I want to also be cognizant of time um, of everyone's day. So I'm going to um, share my screen really quickly to share um, our post-event survey. Can everyone see that okay? Uh, before we do that, there's a question um, oh. from Mark. Mark. Right. Um, and I, I'm presuming you mean the medications I was talking about that uh, reduce the effectiveness of COVID vaccines. Um, so that's CELSET, C-E-L-L-P-E-T. And then Rituxan, and that's R I T U X A N Rituxan uh, X A N. That's right, yeah. 
sorry, I have to spell it myself. Actually, I'm going to type it in the chat because it's easier. For me Perfect. To Thank you. I tried to follow you, but I am more of a visual learner. So I think typing into the chat would be perfect. Thank you. Um, Perfect. Thank you so much for that question, Mark, and for Mary for helping out my spelling as well. And as you see up above up, up the screen is a QR code similar to our Nita for you guys to find a post um, event survey. Um, if you're watching live, and again, this will be recorded, please do take the survey. It really helps um, us shape our future programs. And we'd love to know what you thought of today's and hear um, more of what type of content you'd like to see featured in the future. Um, these programs are built for you all and what you all need. So please um, do recommend any topics that you are hoping to learn more about. Um, just hover your camera over this code. I also sent it into the chat as well. Um, and again, thank you so much for our speakers today. And I really enjoyed today's conversation and today's presentation. I'll follow up with an event recording and any resource resources for the group. Um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and a wonderful weekend. And please reach out if you need anything at all. Um, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Um,